It's the first day of April, and it's time for lunch with Lincoln. Uh, I'm Trig Olson, Senior Advisor to the Lincoln Project. I'm your stand-in first-time host of Lunch with Lincoln, and I'm pretty lucky because I have someone as a guest today who has lots of experience with these kinds of things. Michael Steele, one of the all-time good guys in the business politics. Michael, welcome. Hey, man, it's good to be with you. How's it going? Yeah, we should have a good time today. There's a lot to talk about. So it's April Fool's Day, so it's April 1st. Um, we have seven months to go until voters go to the polls in the midterms. Um, and I just, I thought it would be great to start with how you see the landscape and where the opportunities are for those of us who are on side democracy to make an impact. You know, it, the, the landscape is, is still fairly rocky from my estimation. There is, um, a very still a very strong undercurrent uh, of voters out there who are ready to go back to Trump and Trumpism, and and I think I think that should be very concerning on, on a number of levels. When you look at some of the data, uh, a lot of it is driven by individual anxiety over you know the economy or what may be happening in Europe. Um, just the sheer level of lack of political competency by the Biden administration and the Democratic Party um, to at least narratively give Americans a reason to uh, stay in line and hold the formation on, on behalf of democracy. Um, so absent all of those, all of those essential pieces, um, you know, voters will settle back into uh, an old pattern, an old familiar, maybe somewhat uncomfortable, but yet still familiar pattern um, and give power back to the very party that's been advocating um, usurpation of, of authority, uh, democratizing the, the, uh, uh, our government and our way of life, um, uplifting and supporting author authoritarians and authoritarianism. Uh, and we have to be ever vigilant um, against that. So I'm very, very concerned about the landscape here, you know, some eight months out before the, um, the November elections. It's not to say that there's not room to turn it around, but um, it's going to require a redoubled effort, in my view. And, and I think Americans need to take this, this all seriously because I asked them, what the hell do you think happens on Jan in, in January of 2023 with Kevin McCarthy with the gavel in the House and Mitch McConnell with the gavel in the Senate? What do you what do you think happens? What, what do you think the the outcome is going to be with Trump? I mean, these are the same men who cannot push back against Trump when he's not in office. Right. Yeah. So this, the great setup to get him back in office is in play. Where do you think the resistance is going to be to that? So um, I, I really think Americans need to take seriously the moment and, and consider, yeah, there are things that are as frustrating as hell about uh, what Biden is doing in some regards. But imagine if Trump were, were, were right now um, in command of our, our forces trying to work with our allies to defeat uh, Putin. And that's hard to do when, you know, Trump's, you know, lips are planted firmly on his butt cheek. Yeah, I think, I, so I've been saying to people for a while, you know, I spent a lot of time in that part of the world working for IRI with those fighting for democracy in Ukraine, among other places. And um, one of the things that you use the word serious, and I think one of the, what we're seeing now is something that's really serious with what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, we're talking probably since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the most serious yeah. sort of potential for a conflict. And we have a lot of politicians on the Republican side who are anything but serious. I mean, I think about, you probably saw that video and I'd love your take on it of, of Josh Mandel and one of the other Ohio Republican candidates, you know, standing chest to chest like yeah. the WWE. You got JD Vance who seems to be, you know, completely oblivious to the fact there's 80,000 first generation Ukrainians living in Ohio, right? You know, he's more concerned about the southern border than the Ukraine. Like, what, what, how do we get people on the Republican side to say serious times 
demand serious people. And, you know, nothing could be less serious than electing Donald Trump or guys like J.D. Vance or Mandel or some of these guys at a time when Putin's threatening to, to nuke us. It, it's it's hard. I, I look, I, there, there's no magic bullet here. There's no, uh, you know, obvious solution. It's hard. I mean, it has been a struggle since the party embraced this this form of nationalism um, and Trumpism uh, going back to 2016, and so, but the but the truth of it is, what makes it even harder is it's not just within Republican ranks. I mean, right. you know, Biden is down his almost historic levels with with independent voters. Um, you know, yes. center right Democrats. Uh, so this is not just a question of oh, how do we get Republicans back. This is how do we get Americans who are finding it easier to to say, well, you know, I just paid five dollars for a gallon of gas and, you know, six dollars for a gallon of gas uh, uh, for a, a gallon of milk. And uh, I, I just I, I just can't support this anymore. And I'm going to go back to what? What are you going back to? Because when you we have the, right. the you know, McConnell standing in the in the in the Senate saying when asked, well, if you get power back, what are you going to do with it? What's your what's your agenda? What's your plan? He goes, well, you just have to wait and see, won't you? I mean, is that the answer we really want that 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 fills you up with confidence that there's going to be an agenda after four years of not getting anything done on health care, education, infrastructure, the economy as a whole, except for a tax plan that everybody uh, knows benefited those top 1% more, way more than it did anyone in the middle class. So the reality of it is you, you've got to, and, and I think for me at the end of the day, it really boils down to this. Can we stop just being selfish for a moment? Can we stop being selfish for just a moment uh, and, and just say, you know what, this is, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than my community, right. my tribe. This is about all of us. And right. yeah, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take it in the gut on this one because it's that important. And you don't have leaders out there saying that. And that's right. what makes it that much harder to reach those voters on, on the center right, center left, independents, um, democracy voters who in their gut knows what the right thing is, but that selfish interest sort of overwhelms the moment uh, and they lose sight of what the end game should be. In my view, well, I mean, maybe those who disagree with no, that, no, I, but you I, know. I, I think you're spot on. And, and here's the crazy part. And maybe I have a unique view of this from the work over there, but when you look at, at Zelensky, you know, I saw a survey 87% of Americans have a very favorable impression of Zelensky, right? Because they see him as this leader. But right. what they're missing is the Ukrainian people are letting him lead. And they're setting aside personal interests for common interests. You've got Petro Poroshenko, who's the former president, a guy I worked with, challenging guy. With Zelensky, even though Zelensky beat him in the last election, and in fact, Poroshenko was under house arrest for corruption. He's now, you know, fighting alongside Zelensky because they're letting him lead. They're setting aside personal interests because they get it's serious time. And we're not seeing that. I mean, in some ways with McConnell, uh, I think what you're seeing is he'll, he'll tell us then because he doesn't want to say to his own voters or to the American people because he knows there's no good answer either way. Right. You know? That's right. not serious, and uh, it's a, yeah. it's a massive problem. I, I agree it, with that, and I, and I think that has been fundamentally for, fundamentally for me one of the core elements of our current uh, democratic crisis is that our leaders have become feckless uh, caricatures of mm -hmm. of men, mostly men, uh, who have just sort of swallowed themselves whole at this point. Um, you don't have uh, that, that, that moment of, 
of conviction. And that's what you're describing with Zelensky and Poroshenko, where these two men who were rivals, these two men who, you know, in any other scenario would be at political odds battling for some, you know, uh, additional piece of political turf, now knows that the only turf that matters is Ukraine. That's we right. don't have that leadership here. We have the pres the former president of our country literally asking a, a rogue, vengeful, authoritarian, oh, I'll be polite, <laughs> a-hole uh, <laughs> in Putin for help, to help him right. dig up dirt on his political rival and current president of the United States. That's where we are, America. Right. And, and so we have to stop and ask ourselves, is this really what we've come to? Is this really, is this, as the song goes, is this all there is? Is this it? You know, you know, we're, we're, there is no more laughter. There is no more camaraderie. There's no, there's no more comedy with each other politically, socially, or otherwise. And so what what do you think is going to be the outcome here? All right, fine. You give power back to the party that foments insurrection against the American people and the government that we are, because we represent the government. It's not the building in, capital, in the capital, nation's capital. It's us. It's how our founders right. put it. So you want to give power back to the party that fomented that resurrection, that insurrection. To what end? What the hell do you think they're going to do? What what possibly are you think they're going to do? Oh, tell us all that we should be afraid of the black history of, you know, and, and everything that we don't like is crammed into CRT and, and you know, oh my don't God. Don't say gay. Oh, that we shouldn't don't say, say gay. gay. And, you know, you know, transgendered people are a threat to our culture. <laughs> Tell that up to all the Republican families with a transgendered member. Mm -hmm. are, are you kidding me? So you're now going to turn on your niece or your nephew, your uncle, your aunt because of Donald Trump and a Republican mm -hmm. party that doesn't have a ball amongst them to deal with the moment in, a, in, in an authentic American way? Could you imagine if our grandparents at the beginning of World War One or World War Two, said, you know what? I got better things to do than to go down to that shipyard and build some damn ship. I got I got better things to do than to fight a battle over there when I'm over here. I mean, it, you know, right. could you imagine in the moment, in the critical moments of the civil rights movement, if there weren't enough white, black? And all Americans who said this is important, and they said, you know what? Yeah, black people, you, you, yeah, you are really are three fifths of a person, and therefore we're not going to engage in this battle because it's not in our self interest to do so. I mean, it just right. it just boggles the mind that here we are now, and people just don't even want to give a hoot about what happens next. And it, it, I think it's something we all you know you concerned about. So you you made a great analogy, and I've I've said it this way. Can you imagine if 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 Charles Lindbergh had been calling on Hitler to release what he had on Eleanor Roosevelt? I mean, like what would have happened to him? The great he was an iconic American. They'd have run him out on the rail. Can you imagine if Richard Nixon had appealed to Khrushchev yeah. to say, hey, "60 election was stolen. Give me what you got about Kennedy about and Marilyn Kennedy. Monroe." Yeah. Right? Like, like they would have been run out on a rail, and yet this guy is still holding audience. He's still, He's still audience. got people making the pillage down there. He's got these enablers around them, around him. Who, quite frankly, it's so jaded because they have they have vested economic interests, most of them, in right. in Trump, and so. You know, it's it's just the epitome of serious. So I want to. I talk a lot about you know when I'm talking to groups about democracy and and autocracy and the lessons learned from all that work I did overseas. One of the things I talk about a lot is tipping points. That 
in a battle with autocracy, what you really, you can't get lost in the minutia of the day-to-day -day politics. You have to focus on where are the big battles that matter? I'll give you an example. And then, and then I want to get your sense of where you think the tipping points are. You know, I would argue that, that, that if you look at the Republican side, the primary in Wyoming is a tipping point. If Liz Cheney prevails in that primary, then it, it, it becomes a sign to other some other Republicans that they don't have to be afraid of Trump, that they can speak out, right? Like the more he, the more he loses, um, or conversely, if, if Liz Cheney loses, right, then Republicans will talk about Trump. So that's a tipping point. It's not just any election. There's going to be a lot of primaries. Um, where do you see the tipping points that, that really are going to matter, those big events where things can go either way between now and Election Day, but more importantly, between now and January 20, 20th, 2025, when we have to inaugurate a new president? I like your tipping point. Uh, in fact, I would, I would concur. Um, it may be thematically as, and, and certainly politically, one of the more essential tipping points. And why I, say, why I put the emphasis on that is because either way, win or lose, she still wins. If she wins the primary, mm -hmm. it gives, it says, it just, it speaks to that after all that the state party, the national party and Donald Trump and, and their ilk the Kevin McCarthy's of the world did to stomp her out, she still prevailed. Because at the end of the day, the people of Wyoming know her better than they do. And the people of Wyoming value her more than they do. If she loses, right? If, if, yeah. if she loses, even better for her, because now it will show just how broken the party is. And it frees her up to, to carve a pathway, I think, and I'd like to see towards the presidency. And it gives her an opportunity to now be more of a free range player than she already is. I mean, show you the height of stupidity of Kevin McCarthy. No one bothered to ask him or he asked himself, gee, is... Liz Cheney more valuable inside the tent or outside the tent? Is Liz, Liz Cheney more of a threat inside the tent or outside the tent? Right. And, and so with the actions that they've taken, they've made it easier for Liz to be Liz. And as I tell a lot of my progressive friends, y'all love her now. But when she is full Liz in the policy, y'all going to be scratch your head and running for cover, right? Because she is she is a quintessential right. conservative on a number of critical policy issues. And, you know, we align a lot in that regard. And I'm very happy about that. But right now we're aligned in the democracy space. And so it has freed her up to do and say things that I think have put the party on notice. So I think her race is going to be one to, to really kind of pay attention to. The other one I think to pay attention to is in Utah. Uh, the Senate race there against Mike Lee uh, that's being waged at right now by the independent candidate, Evan McMullen. If Evan is able, because some of the things he's doing there are going to be, I think, potentially uh, bricks in a new path for the future of, of, mm -hmm. of the body politics in creating a third way, another way, so that we are no longer finding ourselves beholden to the Republican and Democratic parties that at the end of the day, don't want every voter to vote, don't want to engage every voter in the act of voting and have very, very parochial, uh, narrowed interests that are driven by um, their, their far left and far right bases and their donors. And, and so that one is going to be, for me, uh, a race to watch as well in terms of the political landscape. More broadly, uh, a, another tipping point will be what happens in November. If the party, I still believe that there, there, there are some elements that I look at and see that Republicans 
may not take the house. And and there are there are some back some factors in play right now, but there's some factors that will be in play in later months that will change the dynamic of this race, starting with the Supreme Court and its rulings mm -hmm. on a host of issues from affirmative action to abortion and how that galvanizes the political basis. Um, and so there are a number of of these moments, seminal or not, that are going to be. Uh, in front of us that will shape the, the, the runway leading up to 2024. Yeah, I think so. So I, I agree with you about the Utah primary, I think is a big one. I think, I think regardless of the general election, I think Kemp versus Purdue is a big one. Oh, that's a lot good, of people, yeah. people in our audience, well, either of them, Stacey Abrams, but in truth, if Kemp prevails, regardless of where people are in the general election, it's a big deal because that is a major loss for Trump. Um, one of the things that, that, that I'm just, I'm curious to talk with you a little bit about, wasn't even in the script for today, but you know, I think back to 2010 when I, in my case, I got sent down to, to work and deal with what they referred to as the Rand Paul situation. I'm sure where you were sitting, you heard about that too after he won the primary, right? Like, I'm more than familiar about all of the elements that went into the Right. <laughs> you know, and then you had Sharon Angle, you had all these people who won. So I think some of that crazy was it was sitting there then, even as it relates to things like we're now seeing with the Russians, but you know, and where where the party is on that. But even if you go most, I know you do Nicole's show a lot. Nicole talks about 2008 and Palin, right? And, and people forget, you know, Sarah Palin, the same night she gave her speech, the Ron Paul people had had packed the Target Center, like 30,000 people at their rally for the Republic. Like some of this stuff has been building for a long time. And, and, and th those tipping, those were all tipping points that we missed where – in some ways, if we could have gotten ahead of the curve, maybe, well, I, you know, I, we could have changed the trajectory or maybe there was no changing it. Maybe it's no, just no, where I, the party I, was I, headed. Yeah, you make a good point, but I, I will I will make a small correction. Um, it w I was more than aware because I was in it. I saw right. the elements. Um, I saw the elements before uh, the Tea Party. Um, right. This goes back. This This really begins back in... Uh, about 1989, 1990 with Newt Gingrich and uh, mm -hmm. the moves that he made inside the House um, ostensibly to push back against uh, 40 years of Democratic hegemony in the House, controlling the House for 40 years, which culminated in the defeat of enough Democrats to take control in 1994, which would have been 40 years after they first took control in 1954. Um but there were elements that were sown, uh, sowed into the into the um, the earth, the political earth at that time, that germinated. But then even that germination is related back to what Nixon did in 1968 with his Southern strategy, right. where he basically said to angry white Southern men who were pissed off that Johnson, who was a segregationist, President Johnson, who was not a fan of civil rights. But because of the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, pressure by Bobby Kennedy, and just I like to think the the evolution on the subject, all right, um, signed off on and worked with Republicans from Illinois and elsewhere around the country to pass the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act in 64 and 65, thereby alienating Southern white men. And Nixon said, that's how we win, because that's how you won the presidency. The road right. to the presidency went to the South. The Republicans held the North. Democrats held the South at that time. Um, and we needed an edge. And Nixon made the bargain. And, and we invited these a-holes into, the into the party. And they are still here. Uh, but then it goes back further than that. It goes back to in 64. Um, with uh, the uh, the presidential campaign um, at that time, when um, you know again civil rights was on the table, 
and you know we decided that you know we were going to fight begin that begin that fight um and and started to move off of civil rights it goes to the, the john birch society which tried to take roots in the party um in the 1960s but the difference was then the party said hell no and pushed back on it so you had these elements have this this essence this thing has been germinating inside the party for some time and so when you get to 2009 and and sort of this emergence of tea party it wasn't directly related to those pieces it was on a constitutional thing it was very upset with the party taking positions that were antithetical to uh, our general philosophy around taxation and the role of government sort of yeah. affront to those libertarian values that we have as republicans um but so we we tried very hard i remember having conversations with the leadership at the time so <laughs> you can't co-opt this no. you can't you can't control this you have to a understand it well b a you have to listen to it b understand it and then figure out how to work with it and that was that was what i tried to do and you didn't have all the crazy that we saw that in subsequent elections during my time because we we figured out how to manage it i remember telling telling um uh uh, what's her name about no more witches we're not talking you know christine o'donnell no nope, we're not talking about witches anymore oh christine o'donnell that, that's just yeah. that's crazy crap yeah. we're not doing that right and and so it's about party discipline focusing around a core message that's tied directly into who we are and what we believe identifying the candidates that best reflect that because at the end of the day voters see candidates as an extension of themselves right and making it happen I think so. So it's so interesting to hear you say that the the um, all of the elements that we're seeing now that have been mainstreamed were there. They were there in that after those 2010 primaries, um, and I remember thinking, okay, we the, 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 you know this can be it can be managed, but that's not classic Republican, right? Like we verticalized top down, which is part of the reason why I think the party was pretty susceptible. All all autocratic yep. are Absolutely. vertical power structures, right? And, I talk and, about and, that all the time. And, and and I broke against that. That's why I I, did. I, I put money into the states. I funded you state know. parties and central committees because that's where the power is. That's where right. our that's where the base is. That's where right. those tea partiers and all these other folks live. So all of a sudden now they were in the game. They were being recognized and they were being asked to contribute. Whereas the autocrat rights went back to the autocratic structure and the whole thing blew up after 2012. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing is I do, you know, one of the things that you took a lot of grief for was an attempt to decentralize, right? Like we're not going to tie up in single vendors that basically control various elements. And one of the things, you know, and Reince, Reince obviously, Reince and I have known each other since college, right? But, and we're in a different place. The reality is, is that, is that that got so much blowback because they've created all of these little constituencies like WinRet, for yeah. example. You know, WinRet is like, and, and so, but those are all power apparatuses for the power. And, and Donald Trump came and ate the pieces. He just put himself on top of all of that. And and now they have, how they break that, I don't know. Well, he was um, the pack man. He, he went in and he gobbled up every little piece. He basically aligned the political operations out of the White House, the RNC, all, all the other ancillary organizations to the extent that he could directly under the banner trump right and all the money flowed to trump and it still flows to trump today you've got the party paying still paying right. the bills for for donald trump that's it's crazy. nice it's and, and think about the the hard-working guys who are dealing with inflation i think about my friends back home in western wisconsin who are all in on it right they all bought up. They changed, you know, the, my understanding is they changed the vendor to one that was a shadow LLC. Trump, they're selling the yard sign. Somebody's profiting off of that. 
And right. that's what that's what got built. And and these guys who are like, well, I paid fifty bucks to get my field signed. And I'm thinking, God, they're taking advantage of you and you're you're busy seeing them as a hero. It's just sad. All right, we gotta start wrapping this up. I wanna I wanna leave I want you to talk about one thing and then we're gonna play a clip to close this out. So Jenny Thomas has been in the news. We can't we can't leave this yeah. thing without talking about that. How how crazy is that? It's crazy, it's embarrassing, it's unfortunate, um, but the reality is there will be no impeachment of the Supreme Court Justice Th Clarence Thomas. Jenny Thomas will continue to engage in whatever behavior Jenny Thomas will engage in, um, and it's because there's no accountability in the system. There just isn't anymore, and, and no one gives a damn. Uh, and we've seen it time and time again in the last six years when these, these elements are stretched and people are pressed um, they always find the excuse not to hold people accountable for their behavior. Um, so, you know, it's, it, I suspect maybe the, the January 6th commission will subpoena her um, and try to get her in front of them to figure out what other aspects of her behavior and her actions are relevant. Um, but I think everything else that people are sort of banting around out there is just a non-starter because there's no one willing to hold anybody accountable anymore. And that's that's the ultimate test for the American people, and we're failing at it. All right, the, that's the, that is a somber note. We're going to leave people with uh, a clip that Lincoln Project just put out on Jenny Thomas. Michael, it's been a pleasure. I'm My really pleasure. glad we got a chance to do this. I hope we yeah. get a chance to do it again sometime, uh, either either online or or offline. We'll, we'll have to get together and do this again. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, as I said, first time ever doing anything sort of like this, hosting a show. Been in Michael's shoes before, but I couldn't have had a better a better guest. And I want to thank you all for watching on uh, Jenny Thomas. Justice Clarence Thomas is compromised. On January 19th, 2022, Thomas was the only Supreme Court justice willing to help Trump and his allies hide from justice over the January 6th insurrection. Thomas did not hide that he was willing to grant Trump's request for secrecy, but it wasn't just to protect Trump and his conspirators. It was to protect his wife, Ginny Thomas. A radical right-wing activist, Ginny Thomas has openly applauded rebellion in the past. I think people are rebelling and there's a big tidal wave coming. I think the Democrats are pretty worried about what's coming. And the lead up to January 6th was no different. Ginny Thomas used her direct line to Trump's White House to push for the overturning of a free and fair election even attending the rally that would ultimately end in an attack on the U.S. Capitol. None of this would be known if Justice Thomas had gotten his way. The January 6th Commission can't do their job if one of the most powerful men in the country is using his seat to protect his best friend. Clarence Thomas must recuse himself because he took an oath to protect the Constitution not his wife. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And that's Lunch with Lincoln.